Hi, and welcome to the Marketing Essentials Podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about the essentials of visual storytelling. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Hi, welcome to the Marketing Essentials Podcast. Our unique team exists to help small businesses improve their marketing through providing essential marketing expertise. And I'm Bill Palmentier, owner of W. Palmentier Photography. I'm Alicia Piazza with Custom Marketing Solutions. And I'm Justin Kerr of Justin Kerr Design. And together we make up the Marketing, marketing Essentials, Essentials Team. team. We actually and, got in sync that time. Yeah, you know, that was once, pretty good. Once in a while we get it right, you know. So you may have noticed we have a fourth person with us here today. And we have the honor of having as our guest, Steve Mason. And he is a professional uh, commercial photographer, and he's agreed to join us today to talk about visual storytelling. So I'm going to turn things over to Bill now. Before we get started, I want to just kind of give everybody a background. I've, I've known Steve for a while now, and uh, I just want to read his, his bio real quick. Sure. Steve's a, Steve Mason is an, is an award-winning pro, uh, photographer out of Providence, Rhode Island. He's based in commercial and fine art photography, specializing in environmental portraits, military, technolo technology, and manufacturing, easy for me to say, and architecture, sorry. His fine art photography can be seen in many local galleries, and he has over 30 years in the industry working all over the United States. He is dedicated to creating visual branding solutions, and Steve is, skilled, is equally skilled on location or in studio. So at the end, we'll, uh, we'll post a, a link for Steve's address for anybody that wants to see some more of his work, but we will be showing, showcasing some of it today. So uh, first off, welcome, Steve. Thank you for uh, joining us today. Thank you for having me. Appreciate yeah. it. So um, storytelling. Tell me a little bit about uh, what you do when it comes to thinking about storytelling when, uh, when taking images for uh, a client. Well, um, Justin brought up a great point because he started off with your mission statement, and I'm a big fan of a mission statement because it gives me a guideline as a as a visual guy to work from sure. I can get a sense of how you feel about your company and what it purports to do both within the community of the company itself and also the outside community I can have at least a starting point to work from and I use that as a good reference uh, for major corporations that can be fairly easy to do they have a good sense and have actually put a lot of time and effort in putting together a mission statement but smaller companies, it's it's a lot harder. They may have worked within their company for a long period of time, but don't have a sense of what that mission statement is. They have a deep understanding of their company, but it's often very hard to, to get them to verbalize that in a way that I can take that and use it visually. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of questions, a lot of sit down time, a discussion, a tour. I'll find out about their company, whether it's a family owned company or um, how many generations the family may have had it. Uh, the, the, not just the generational part of it, but there's the technology. How much money have they put into their technology? Are they about to put more money into it? And a lot of this stems from I'm often getting a call because they're redoing their website, redoing their branding, and they, they may not know exactly how they want to approach it. They just know they have to make a change. So, so what I hear you saying, Steve, is basically um, you take a lot of things into account when it comes to telling a story of a company. I do. Uh, it's not just the branding. It's not just the, the, the uh, taking pretty images, so to speak. It's more about how do you convey properly the essence of what that what your client is. Exactly. I, pretty images don't necessarily help the client, mm -hmm. especially if, uh, you know, a lot of times, especially in manufacturing situations, because as a commercial photographer, that is just basically a nice way of saying I'm a business to business photographer. Sure. I don't shoot weddings or bar mitzvahs or any of those kinds of things. Yeah. I work with businesses. Yeah. Um, but a lot of those businesses are not very good looking. Uh, just as an example, manufacturing in New England is basically three different kind of sub 
categories. There's high tech, low tech, but the majority of businesses I go into or manufacturers that I go into are a combination of the two. So you can have a high tech machine like a you know, computer driven CNC machine, but next to it there's a guy who's boiling something that he's gonna pour into a mold and mm-hmm. two hours later pull it out and cut off all the extra pieces that are on it. So in, you know, within 20 feet you've got ex- extremely high tech and then extremely low, low tech. tech. And that's pretty common in New England. There's also, in New England you'll find manufacturers that have machines that are 50, 70, 80 years old, but and they may use them only once or twice a year, but when they need them, they need them. And the machines, those types of machines just don't break down. They're made really well. There's a cost benefit kind of analysis. At some point, they may get rid of the machines, but if they use it twice a year, they need it twice a year. Mm-hmm. So I, you have a really interesting story as far as uh, how you get your start in photography. Can you take it just a minute and just kind of explain you know, your, where you started? As so as, as a kid, I just, like any other kid, got a camera and took pictures, but my dad pretty much was looking the smart guy that he was, was looking for our interests and how to nurture that. So he would bring home books of photographers that <clears throat> kind of made a difference in the world, more social justice type photographers. Uh, Lewis Hine, his work influenced um, getting the child labor laws changed. Uh, there's a guy, a gentleman, Jacob Reese, who shot pictures in the ghettos in, in New York City, which got a lot of those laws changed. Mm-hmm. So we nurtured that, and that developed my interest and slowly went on from there. And from that, I decided to go to school. I went to a place called Brooks Institute of Photography mm-hmm. in California, which is now defunct. It went away. They they made you false claims. Yeah, wasn't it? Or yeah, you, they made it? false claims about how many people are actually uh, making a living doing <laughs> photography. Oh, wow. Tough tough business to be. And they got called know. on it. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a lot of schools who won't do that now. I think because of this situation. Mm-hmm. And then from there, I went on to Manhattan and I worked there for three and a half, four years as a photo assistant doing all sorts of great jobs with well-known photographers. That's actually where I met my wife because she was a stylist. Uh, if you remember the old Virginia Slims ads, you've come a long way, baby. She did some of those and some wow. other things. Oh. And that's how we met. It was uh, There's a great story where we met on one particular shoot. It was for IBM. We were photographing a chamber quartet in a chicken coop in New Jersey. So there's four... <laughs> Sounds like right, a bad no, wait joke a minute. almost. There's a story right there. Can there's you? Story right why there. were you in a chicken coop? I don't remember the tagline. I'll actually dig it up and send it to you yeah, guys. Yeah, be great. You can put it on the website. Uh, they were sitting down playing, and it was just a dirty, smelly chicken coop. And my wife, not my wife at the time, but she became my wife, was styling all of this. And we were setting up the lights and orchestrating the photograph. The fun part of this, we were running around trying to pick up the chickens. And there was this 80-year-old guy there, Al. And he says, <laughs> he's watching us, and he's laughing at the New York City kids. And he says, where do you want the chickens? So we tell him, and he just scoops up two chickens in the blink of an eye, <laughs> grabs them by the feet, and spins them around. So apparently when chickens get dizzy, get dizzy they stay still. So he slapped them on the ground, these two, and then he grabbed two more. We had four chickens, I believe. And, and they involved. stayed still for about five minutes. And then they started wobbling, and they'd get out of their dizziness and start walking around. He'd grab them again, and he did this three or four times wow. while we were shooting. And he gave us statue chickens for the shoot. Oh, That's what amazing. What goes into this behind-the-scenes work? Behind the scenes. <laughs> I wonder if that would work on my kids. If I spun them around, they would yeah, sit still now they just for get sick. Minutes. I tried it. No, I'm kidding. Right. I'm kidding. <laughs> But okay. I mean, so, so basically, Steve, you've you've got a real background in storytelling, just outside of just the, the the photography part of it. It seems like everything I've ever spoken to you about, as far as uh, shoots you've been on, things along that line, all have a specific story. Is that something that you gravitate towards, as far as uh, when you do your photography? It's a hook that I'm looking for. So if I approach it as just a job, it's going to look like a job. If I approach it as just uh, something to do, it's going to look like that. I can remember. When we first moved up here, I actually got a job as a staff photographer for GTE, which ultimately became General Dynamics. And the mm-hmm. first shoot I went on, I looked at the images and I thought, these are awful. I would never hire me. <laughs> and I realized I had to figure out a way to insinuate myself, to find a hook, a way in emotionally 
mm-hmm. to these people, to what was going on. Mm-hmm. So I just started asking myself a series of questions. You know, what's going on here? Who's in charge? What they're doing? If it's, a, if it's an event, for instance, there might be three people talking. You know, what are they talking about? Is it a, is it a joke? Is there going to be a punchline? And just watch and watch the body language as well because that's a dead giveaway as to what's going to happen and pretty soon if you get you know you might get people exploding with laughter or you know pointing at each other or sometimes you know pressing their fingers into each other's chest or whatever it may be some moment that gives it a real uh, a real moment you know a, a, something that's genuine mm. authentic i guess so, is the term so why these days. why is this important to one of your clients that you that you bring out that story of their business because i think it tells their story i mean i'm i'm, I'm a big infer guys so I if you look at so for instance I did a, a, a job for a company in in one socket actually called energy geeks and in a discussion with the owner of the company he was telling me that his guys were going to work on a local park they were going to cl- help clean it up mm-hmm. so I said we, you should be talking about that for your social media so I went and photographed that and what I noticed from his guys is they were relentless there was a tree that had grown through a refrigerator from I don't know, the 1930s or 40s, and they wanted that refrigerator out, and they were just pulling shards of it, and you could see the determination on Mm. their face, and that's what I was looking to get, because if I can show the determination on their face, just pulling a refrigerator out of the ground, not even for pay as a volunteer thing, then it's very easy to infer that his guys are very dedicated, very disciplined, and hardworking people. So. I'm always looking for something that you that may have no meaning now, but it infers something greater in the long run. Yeah, we we've talked before in a in a previous podcast about storytelling that that emotional element is very important because sure, people yeah. make decisions based on emotion. Mm-hmm. So whether they're you know being persuaded to donate to that charitable organization or purchase a service or something, they need to have that emotional connection. So it's interesting that you know you're looking at it from okay what can I pull out of this to tell a good story and create that emotional hook so that the person on the other end feels something similar? Mm-hmm. You know, it's a real equation. It's not just, okay, is it framed right? How's the composition? How's the lighting? There's there's a lot more to it than just right. the, the, the technical aspects of it. Well, the technical aspects after a certain amount of time in your life <laughs> almost become secondarily, secondary, so you can start really paying attention to the content of what you're doing, and that's that's what I try to do. Um, and the, the, the technical aspects of it, if once you, especially with digital, once you understand the parameters pretty well, you can deal within that f- easily and nicely. I mean, there's a lot of tools that help you get what you want. Um, everyone's going to say. Uh, actually, uh, that, that's, I think it's a good segue to, to talk a little bit about uh, something that you just done recently, which is your uh, Lieber's Lace project. Yeah. Um, so the, part of what I guess keeps me sane is not only the business aspect of what I do, which I enjoy, but I'm always looking for something on the side to keep sharpening my skills, to keep me interested, what's the story. Sure. And one of those stories came about in, actually it was 2011, I was putting it together a photography show with two friends, and we very cleverly entitled it Three Friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I noted, I walked away from the, at the area we were hanging from, and the downtown Pawtucket uh, has a place where you can hang a gallery show for uh, Samuel Slater Museum, and they had okay. a little seven-inch monitor going with a, a lace machine. And I thought, oh, this thing's really cool. I got to find out more about this. So it took me a few months to track it down. I went into the the uh, facility and got a tour, and I was hooked. Mm-hmm. And they were unbelievably gracious. There's a gentleman by the name of York Roberts who runs the place. And I think I was there twice, and on the third time I called him up and said, hey, I've got a day off, I want to come in and shoot. And he goes, yeah, I'm not going to be here, but come on in, go do your thing. <laughs> Don't worry about it, just go for it. Mm-hmm. The only thing I couldn't do was light. I did light the portraits, but I couldn't light any of the machines or any of those kinds of sure. things. So I figured out a strategy for combining images from different uh, exposures to get what I wanted. Mm-hmm. But what the Leavers Lace book is about is the last lace manufacturing company in America. Okay, I'm going to actually, before we go too far, I'm going to throw up on screen here so our viewers can actually see. This is this is the book, and I will actually, you know what, let me back oh, off. Actually, I was going to Vanna White it. Okay, got Justin, go ahead, so Vanna White it. Wait. We have Steve's book here, <laughs> Leavers Lace. You can pull it up on the monitor. Yeah, I'm going to pull it up on the monitor, and uh, we will in the show notes put a way that if you're interested, 
how you can purchase this book directly from Steve. Uh, but Steve, let's talk about this a little bit. Um, so obviously, there's a big story behind this whole thing. So I'm going to run you through a couple of pictures, and maybe you can kind of tell the story of what you saw as sure. you were, were doing it. Let's do this one first. So again, it's the last lace manufacturing company in America. They make some of the best lace in the world, and they do it with machines from 1890, 1900. They're just grimy, greasy, smelly, dirty machines. To me, the contradiction was those machines producing some of the finest lace in the world. It's sure, so, sure. So uh, dainty and fragile. That's what I thought anyway when I first went in, and then I watched them, and they're dragging it across the floor, and oh, it's greasy and dirty. <laughs> but the, the lace goes from there to a, a company that washes and dyes it. So everything that comes out of the machines is white, but it could be red, it could be green, it could be blue. So mm. this is a really interesting machine contraption, whatever you want to call it. Do you actually know the names of, or the history of these machines? Or? I don't. I know a little bit about some of them. Um, in fact, the... Um, probably going to be giving a presentation at some point and it will be I believe at Stillwater Books oh nice newly opened nice. in Pawtucket and I will hopefully bring in York Roberts who is the manager of the place he's a fourth generation weaver mm -hmm. and can tell you everything about the entire history of these machines okay let's go to the next photo here this is obviously a loom of some sort it is so there's threads that come in from three different sources on these machines there's about 12,000 threads that come up at any given time and you're looking at all or a section of those threads that come in to make the lace. Mm -hmm. But it's just the patina of everything that I noticed mm -hmm. is just so worn down and smooth. It has its own kind of quality. Sure. Also, now, coloration. You, you were, we were talking about this uh, the other day, about the book, and you were telling me a story about how the guy that runs this particular machine, uh, you know, there's all this noise of the machine and all the noise from the other machines, and there's like, what, 3,000 strands here, and he can pick out if one of the strands has snapped. Is There's one gentleman who told me, and he's, he's a, he's a uh, third generation, generation weaver. In fact, I took him, when I asked him when, where he wanted to be photographed, he showed me a machine. He said, come over here, let's do this one. He said, I've worked on that machine for over 25 years. And I said, okay. My father worked on that machine for over 40 years. And I, his father worked on that machine. Him, that's it. Okay, Bob actually, Grundy is his nobody name. can see it. So hang on a second, let me pull it up here because I was just kind of jumping through here. Ooh, hang on, here we go. Okay, so this is the picture you're talking. Oop, try again. This is the picture you're talking about. Right. So he's worked on that machine for over 25 <laughs> years. He grew up next to that machine because his dad worked on it for over 40 years, and his grandfather worked on it for over 40 years. So ever since it came into this country in 1890. There's been a Grundy working on that machine. Mm. It just, wow! It made me think of the the um, Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's got a hundred times that probably. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. But he's the guy who actually said that he's working. He can hear a thread break, which wow. I found hard to believe. And I brought it up to a couple of the other weavers and said, "Nah, there's no way." But that's what he says, so I can't argue <laughs> with him. You got you got to trust him on that one. Yeah. This is another cool photo here. Yeah, that's actually my, my favorite. Actually, yeah, it's your your favorite. So this, as I said before, there's three different areas that or, or sources that the thread comes from. What she's doing is loading thread on 150 bobbins. They're small, about two and a half inch to diameter brass. Uh, they take two, two brass pieces and put them together and the thread gets wound in between them. She drops the thread into the middle of each one, breathtaking speed, I can't believe how fast she does it, and then she has a foot pedal and she ro just uh, rolls about uh, anywhere from 90 to 120 yards worth of thread depending on the thickness of the thread. Wow. And it's, it's just blisteringly fast. Whew. And it, there's a religious aspect of this here too, with she's got the, the cross Nope, hang on, let me go back to it. I shut it off. Uh, there we go. See, oh, yeah, the, the, the slightly blurred cross right. there. Yeah. The other thing yeah. I'll point out, in the background, you can see a green rag. And when I first thought of this project, I thought it was, because the machines are so monochromatic, I thought it was going to be a black and white project. But after a while, in, as we see the pictures, you'll notice that those rags come in red, green, blue, orange. And to me, they became a metaphor for hope. So I left it as a color project because... That's part of it, but also because there's so many different light sources and everything, the palette became kind of muted and interesting. Mm -hmm. So I just kept it as a color project. What I uh, can you go back to that one, Bill? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, 
what I like about this photo, and I, I just love these kind of photo essays. As a matter of fact, I, went, I came to your gallery opening when you first presented these um, and just found that each one told a very interesting story. But I think the reason I like this one is, you know, there's obviously the, the, the focus on the machine and there's the interaction between her and the machine and her focus on what she's doing and the hands are involved. But the element, I mean, you talked about the rag, but I'm looking at the crucifix that's hanging there. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. That, to me, that, it, that adds a whole other layer to the story. It's like, this is her space. This is where she is every day. Sure. And she's personalized it. Mm -hmm. And you get the sense that she's been there for a while and has a lot of experience working with this. And, as, and, and she's almost working with this machine in a very sort of loving and almost maternal manner. And just the juxtaposition between the crucifix and her and the machine, I think, just tells... Not only is it a fascinating composition, but it just I think it tells a very interesting story. Honestly, I could stand in front of this thing for hours and just find all different things. Just look at the detail that's in it and think about like you were saying earlier, Steve, it's like, what's the story behind this? How long has she been at this machine? You know, what what kind of family is she from? What are her what what is she thinking about as she works on this every day? Because obviously she's gotten so good at this. She's probably like making a grocery list in her head while she's doing this, right? <laughs> Thinking, of, you know. There's an amazing pride there. They they have a good sense of what they're doing because all when I first went there I thought lace, so it's doilies and or curtains, but I was wrong. It's all about fashion and it's high fashion. So the the it's you know, in the old days somebody may have come in and ordered from Kmart for 200,000 square yards of something, but now it's much smaller runs much faster runs sure. and much more complicated runs. Very often they'll work on patterns that the computer-driven machines can't do. Because mm -hmm. computer-driven machines like consistency of pattern. They don't like interruptions and changes that make sure. it more complicated. And that's part of what they do. Let's take one more photo because I, I really like this one myself. And you were, Steve, you were saying there's a, a story behind this photo. There is. So this guy makes the spare parts. He's, he's actually passed away now, but uh, when I first went there, I, of course I had no idea of any of this. I walked into his workshop area and I saw a train, a to scale um, steam train. It was about three and a half, four feet long, and that was, I thought, a good conversation started with him. He has a very thick, or had a very thick Cockney accent. Turns out it was a to scale steam train that he had built from scratch that worked. He showed wow. me the little pellets that actually went in the working furnace. Wow. The pellets would catch fire, wow. create steam, and make the wheels move. So it was a working steam it engine? It was to scale in every wow. way in perfect scale. This guy was absolutely amazing. He was a genius. And there were a lot of geniuses there, but he, he just captivated me. Yeah. He, he just, in this picture here, this image, he looks like he's just in contemplative thought about, okay, what am I going to build next? <laughs> you know? George is very pensive. He is not a talker. He's a doer, was a doer. He um, would solve any problem for anybody. He would make the spare parts they needed from scratch, and they'd all be perfect. He's just an amazing guy. It's sad to see him mm -hmm. no longer with us. Well, that's fascinating in itself that... You know, you have somebody in-house who making the spare parts because these are 110, 120 year old machines. You're not just going to run down to the store and pick up a, <laughs> you you know, those a, a spare part. No. Um, <laughs> so the fact that you know he's there to make sure that all of this keeps running is that's just fascinating. I think the, even more amazing than that to me was after G George had passed away, I went and saw York Roberts, the guy who runs the company, and I said, "What are you going to do now?" He said, I don't know, we'll figure it out. <laughs> and I laughed because that is the general atti attitude there. There's a machine that's, you know, granted the machine is big and heavy and most of the parts don't wear out. The same parts have been running for 100 years, but the smaller, finer parts do wear out and they have to be replaced. So it's just an attitude of, I don't know, we'll figure it out. <laughs> and they do. So you got some incredible work here, Steve. Thanks for sharing that with us. Oh, you're welcome. Um, Another question that comes to mind is, we're obviously reaching out to people that are trying to figure out how to market their business. Well, anybody really. I'm, I'll, I'll have a cup of coffee with anybody. I'll sit and talk with anybody and discuss how they're doing, where they want to go. A lot of what I do comes from people who are graphic designers, website builders, mm -hmm. companies where 
they may have gotten uh, some sort of a company who's looking to rebrand, start off as a branding and not sure where to go, mm -hmm. and visuals is a part of that. One of the things I like to do is if I get a call from a company to go in and photograph, whether it's manufacturing or technology or a construction company or any anything like that, I want to know who their website builder design slash designer is because I want to have a conversation with them. Many times a web person has spent hours and days and weeks with that company mm -hmm. and has a pretty thorough understanding of where they are, where they want to go. Whereas I may go in for a couple hours and sit with them and there's going to be holes in the conversation. Things that you know maybe the web guy has picked up on and is trying to uh, inculcate into the branding of the website and, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm big on having that conversation and so, working that in. So say for instance you're devoid of that designer and you're going into a client for the first time and say you know we really don't have a story what what do you do to try to encourage them to get that story out of them I'll ask for a tour and if I get a tour I'll ask about the machines I'll ask about how they got into the business how long they've been doing it did they start off were they one of the workers is it, is it a family business so as I'm slowly getting to put the pieces together by the time we walk back to his office I'm basically saying yeah you do have a story <laughs> you just haven't thought about it mm -hmm. why don't we sit down and talk about this and there's yeah. a way you should be talking about this the other thing that's interesting New England is probably more puritanical. There's a lot of companies out there. I've got a new website coming out in the next few weeks, and one of the areas that I have on the website is corporate social responsibility. It's a big thing now, and I try to have that conversation with clients because clients often do something in the community, but they don't necessarily want to talk about it. So if I can get them to open up, maybe even have me come and photograph it and put that out and use that from a social media perspective, then that is huge for them and I'm sure Alicia you would want to Absolutely. talk about that because yeah. it's a great way to get your name out it's a great way to get you involved in the community known in the community elevated in the community and get some respect can, yeah. can, can you give an example of one of the clients that you work with that was that along that social responsibility standpoint well I just finished photographing uh, last week a community day for Millipore Corporation so what happens is there are five different locations that I went to within in a one day shoot. And they have, let's see, there was a elementary school, there was a grade school, a couple other things where they go in and they may be painting the sides or you know painting a building, they may be repairing a deck, they may be putting up, this has all happened in the past, putting up you know, jungle gyms in, in a daycare center's playground all sorts of different things. This particular company is great in the sense that it, it dedicates, every employee has two days PTO, paid time off, dedicated to volunteerism. So they can pick a charity and go and work there and be paid by the company to do it, which I think is absolutely amazing and uh, kudos to them. So there's a lot, there's that. Um, co some companies do like a, a, a Christmas in July, uh, the company energy geeks I was talking about they went to a local park and they were cleaning up the park so anything along that line that I think can elevate you within the community and make yourself known within the community is a great thing do you think businesses kind of shy away from showing that or they just don't think that that's something that I mean I think when businesses are like oh what am I gonna do for my photography and my visuals they sometimes just forget to, to show not only who they are as a company but like who they are as part of the community I think exactly. That, that's definitely correct. I think there are a lot of companies that are uncomfortable with putting the spotlight on what they do from an altruistic point of mm -hmm. view because it makes them look mercenary by doing that. Mm -hmm. The opposite can be true, obviously, but at the same time, you can't push it too much because then it looks like you are taking advantage. But it's a good thing to do. I photographed um, a painting construction company that did a build-a-bed you know, it's just a small thing. They get all their guys together and they build beds for poor people and go out and deliver them. And it just is huge, I think, for him because this this particular guy wants to pay back the community and the community gets something out of it too. But right. he's smart enough to come in and hire me to photograph it and put it out and use it for social media, possibly <coughs> recognizing it has some value from a marketing or branding perspective. And that's a big thing too, and I'm sure... Justin can help and talk about this as well, but branding 
is not necessarily just your logo or how your website looks, but it's everything. It's the work you do within the community. It's the, how your people represent themselves when they're not at work, if they're wearing your T-shirts, which they often are. It's a lot of different things that people just don't think about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we actually did a, a podcast on that uh, branding. Third one, like I think. Number, yeah, third or fourth one. Mm-hmm. And you're right. Um, your brand is not just your logo or your color palette. It's how people experience you as a organization. And I can see where, you know, what you've been talking about in storytelling through the photography definitely adds to that brand, you know, because it's it's part of the voice of the company. And it can show some really interesting aspects of an organization. It can help tell their story. And it's how people experience them. Mm-hmm. You know, it's uh, definitely through the, through the photography. I was sitting recently with um, uh, a private uh, high school academy and looking at some of their marketing work. And what tells their story is the photographs. I mean, the, the students in the chemistry lab and the students on the athletic field and the teachers working with mm-hmm. students. I mean, without that, they wouldn't be able to tell their story, you know. And it has to be done well. And it has to be, like you were talking about earlier, it has to be done in a way that is natural and believable and not staged and, you know, really brings out that unique story that each organization has to tell. Yeah, I think the word these days, the popular word is authentic. Everybody's looking for that authentic moment, and that's what we're all looking for. Do you think social media might have something to do with that, where before we had brochures and we had websites and people maybe wanted to be super professional about stuff, and now... With social media, we have the ability to like form relationships as businesses and actually add like a human element to it. I do. I also think that social media can tend to put a, a spyglass on on something that's false. Mm-hmm. So, inauthenticity or unauthenticity becomes more obvious through social media. But when it, you know, if you go out and say I'm committed and I'm honest and I care. That's one thing, but to back it up, to show some of these deeds, how you act in the community, the things you do, it's a great way to to kind of highlight that. Yeah, I definitely think consumers can pick up on when you're not sincere, when you're just doing it for the marketing or whatever. So, Well, I mean, this is sort of tangential to what Steve's talking about, but in social media, oftentimes you, you want your audience or your customers to contribute to the conversation. So mm-hmm. they're taking selfies or they're taking photographs and they're posting it up. And that also can tell the story of sure. the organization from their point of view. Yeah. Right, and that that's huge. In fact, we were talking about this before we started. There's a company that I work for that does events for their employees and I'll photograph that. And there's another company I do that for as well that I'll photograph. but. The one company brands the heck out of it. There's their logo everywhere. There's their mission statement everywhere. So every time I take a picture, it's easy to get that in the background. And it's the other company does not. I have a picture of seven people sitting on stage answering questions, and there's a black curtain behind them, which to me is the perfect opportunity to at least hang a banner, and there's nothing. And these are both big, multi-million dollar companies. But it, the, it's not so much about my photographs because my photographs for both of those companies are going to pretty much be internal. It's about the selfies. So the people walking around taking pictures of themselves with their friends and holding up the bags of you know f- uh, swag that they're getting for free, if they have that branding in the background and people, their brothers, aunts, uncles, mom and dad, see those pictures that they're sending out, Facebook or what have you, they're going to know who they're working for and they're going to see that those people care. Sure. The other company has nothing branded and people are looking at that at those pictures going, who are they? Where do they work? There's a whole different message. And the other thing that comes through is the company that is branded, that's given away the swag and everything, those pictures of the people seem more committed, more interested, more dedicated, and they're certainly having more fun. Sure, plus it also... It also makes it easier on Alicia's end yeah. when she's tasked to put something up on social media. When that branding's in the background, it's a lot easier to right. to, to showcase that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so. that's very interesting. Like the perspective of a company that's committed, and it's just via photo. You know, it's not like they're they're uh, putting their logo on the photos. It just happens to be part of the event. The yeah, it's part atmosphere. of it's part of the story. Yeah, it's part of the story the mm-hmm. picture is telling. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's, that, that's a more authentic way to do it, you know. 
uh, whether they're wearing a t-shirt or whether they've got the swag bag or there's something in the background. Um, more authentic than if you were just stamping the logo on after the fact. You yeah, know? yeah. But because I see companies do that, and it's kind of like if you had just made the the photo from the start, brand it, or had a better experience, or a company, I guess, a company presence, then it would have worked out better. <laughs> Alicia was saying earlier, it's like we really need like marketing essentials, coffee mugs, because we need yeah, to start branding we ourselves better. The, the stage know. with the background, like yeah, yeah, we yeah. don't have anything, but we're not it, a multi-million it's, dollar it's company the, it's, yet. It's the cobbler's kids that have no shoes, right? Yeah, I like so, that idea. Yeah, we're getting yeah. there. We're getting there. We're a little bit at a time. <laughs> so um, I think we're just about towards the end here, as far as uh, wrapping it up. Final thoughts, Justin. Um, I really appreciate you t telling us about this Levers Lace project, and I'm really happy to see the book out. I mean, I, I've been hearing about this for a while, and I know you've been it's taking anxi a long time, anxiously really waiting. Nice. But it's a beautiful yeah. book. The, the photography is amazing, and I just really appreciate you coming in and sort of giving us a an inside look. I'm trying to look there at it that. Is. <laughs> hey Steve, we can't see your face lower. <laughs> Giving us an inside look on okay, what you look for when you go in and do a photo shoot for an organization. What do you you know, you're really thinking about the end result. Yes, you know, is that old absolutely. saying of like start with the end in mind? Or you you really are thinking about that. You're not just going in and saying, Well, I'm just gonna take some pictures and hand them my invoice and I'm done. Yeah, I have you know my discussion I've had is if you want somebody to come in to take a picture of this machine, I'm generally not your guy because I'm going to ask you why this machine, what's important about this machine, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. through a series of questions may f actually come to find out that that machine isn't going to do you any good because it's 40 years old and there's other companies that have 20-year-old machines and maybe the discussion ought to be what your biggest asset is, and it probably isn't the machine. It's often your people. people. Right. Sure. Well, like a lot of um, designers and other people that work in our profession, the ones that are really at the top of their game are the ones that ask those questions mm -hmm. because they really want their customer, their client, to look good, you know, they want to tell an effective story. Sure. So, you know, the difference between a hired gun just to come in and take photos and somebody who really is interested in what is your organization about? Because I want to tell that story. There's a right. huge gap between those and, two. And the reality is that's a lost art form nowadays. Yeah. There are fewer and fewer photographers out there that will take the time to say, yeah. I want to know why you're doing this. What's the importance of this? As, yeah, like Steve said, you can hire anybody to come in and shoot a pretty picture. Take of, photos, of, of, yeah. You know, of, of there's something. There's the technical aspect, and then there's the yeah, understanding. Yeah. And, and if you deeper. if you really need to connect this to an ROI, yeah. you know, for the customer, you can say, well, if we're able to make an emotional connection with your prospective clients, mm -hmm. that is going to mean Huge. more revenues for your business because people make purchasing sure. decisions based on, on emotion, emotion. Mm -hmm. and you've got a lot of competition. And you really need to have an advantage over your competition, so you need to make that emotional connection. That's all part of that differentiating right. yourself from your competition. Yeah, right. and right. you said something yeah. interesting when you introed and how you were, um, you started out in photography, but history, ph photography has changed elements of history. You oh, mentioned absolutely. the child labor. So if photography, if good photography can change history, I think it can make a difference in your marketing. Sure, sure. <laughs> so. So Very Steve, well said. A great, probably a good way to end this. <laughs> yeah, we're going to end it, but one thing that I do want to make mention that we haven't mentioned yet, and unfortunately for, for, for the sake of brevity, we, we're not going to attach it to the actual podcast, but Steve did create a YouTube video that is the story of Lever's Lace. Mm -hmm. We're going to attach that to the podcast notes. So yeah, that that'll be in the notes. Chance to see it. Check it out. You really need to take the time to watch it. Again, Steve, how, if somebody wants to get your book, we'll put that in the notes too. But what's the easiest way to do it? Through your website? You can contact me through my website or Stillwater Books in Pawtucket. It's the same price either way. Great. If you give me a call, we can have a cup of coffee and I'll sign it for you. Awesome. awesome. Oh, wow. wow. I'm waiting on my signed copy. No yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you again, Steve, for joining us today. We appreciate it. It's been a pleasure having you here. It's good to be yeah. here. Thank you very much for having me. And of course, me. now is the time for our shameless plug. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, we appreciate you spending time with us today on the podcast. You can reach us through our website, marketingessentialsteam.com. There's a, uh, our free webinar is there. Yes. You can take a look at that. It's a, a one hour webinar on marketing that covers photography as well as social media and websites. That's yeah, what we did, we did back in February. Did yeah. that back in February. That's available there. You can see 
all of our podcasts on our website and you can contact us through the website and if you have any questions for anybody here on the team or if you have a suggestion or an idea for a podcast topic or a suggestion for our next guests on our podcast you can reach We'd us through the it. website also you can find us on facebook um, at Marketing Essentials Team. team yep. Yes. And uh, you can get updates there on what we're doing next, what's the latest thing that Alicia has tried to make her a true Rhode Islander. Had my off waffle. Uh, <laughs> That's right. Actually, the other, the other thing is also if you have an idea. Because we've already done a few things in the podcast. We've done the awful awful. We've done... Uh, New York System. New York System. Yacht Club Soda. Yacht Club Soda. Uh, there was one other thing with Union it we did. Union Brewery. Union Station oh, Union Station Brewery, Brewery right. Yeah, we're also going to be at some point in time doing the Rocky uh, Rocky Point Chowder and Clam Cakes. I could go for right. some Dells right now. Some I know Dells, I just yeah. had it. Yeah. <laughs> now, are you not? Okay, so this is this is one of those things that if you go around Rhode Island, everybody has their opinion about where the best clam cakes are. I happen to like Iggy's. Yeah. A lot of people like Rocky Point. You have. I'm assuming you have a favorite. I don't have a favorite. Um, I'm still looking. But I pulled into the Rocky Point store, yeah. you know, in front of the Yen and Hope on yeah. uh, Post Road in Warwick, yeah. And I thought, oh, this is so cool, and tried it, and the chowder was inedible, and the oh. clam cakes oh, no. were, were were so things have changed, yeah. barely acceptable. So they weren't the, the Rocky Point chowder and clam cakes I remember oh, as a right. kid. Well, yeah, because yeah. they moved; they were further down the road in that little uh, storefront for a while, and they were. Fairly well, decent back I'm then. remembering them from when I had a paper route. And yeah, they used to have all the paper boys go to Rocky Point. Well, the, the other place we that we... Of course, yeah. we have to explain to Alicia. There used to be small children that would deliver newspapers to your front door. <laughs> it's a newspaper route, what? <laughs> okay, this is getting way out so of control. If, if I may, Sorry. before we finish, please support these people in any way you can. It's wonderful that they're taking the time, energy, and there's a lot of work and preparation that goes into doing this to try to explain... In, in, a, in a nice, interesting, cohesive manner, what marketing and branding is to, to kind of answer your questions. And mm -hmm. I'm a big adherent of that. And so Thanks, we got to give him that check later for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. We'll so. give him that gift card to Rocky Point Chowder House. <laughs> <laughs> uh, somehow I have a feeling that would be uh, a, a giveaway later on. Yeah, that might be. Yeah, gifting. Yeah. All, right, All right, so, so we got to wrap this up. Let, let's, uh, Thank you guys for joining us. Yes, absolutely. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for being our guest. Thank you. Glad and to as be we here. say, that's a wrap. We'll see you guys next time. Bye.